Welcome to the Ninja Coaching Coast to Coast podcast, where our mission is to help you learn and grow by sharing the tips, ideas, tricks, and more that we learn from speaking with top producing real estate agents around the country every single day. I'm Matt Benelli here with Ninja Coaching founder and owner Garrett Fry. And although we focus a lot on real estate, this podcast is not just for real estate agents. It is for anyone who is looking to better their business and increase their income per hour in order to enjoy all of the things that life has to offer. So prepare to take in a lot of value that you can put into action in your business and your life. Enjoy the show. my gosh, we have made it. It is episode 100. Matt, I can't believe we're here, but wow. I'm 100 excited. episodes, 50 weeks. <laughs> <laughs> this is awesome. We like we started this in January and here we are. It's December episode 100. Man, this is this is exciting. Truly. It's is. pretty cool. It's pretty cool. So, okay. So for today's episode, we decided to take a little bit of a different route than we normally take. Uh, normally, you know, Matt and I analyze our weeks. We look at what's working, what's not with agents that we see around the United States. Hopefully a lot of you saw it. If not, we threw the questions out to everybody saying, Hey, give us your questions. What would you like to hear us talk about? We, you know, we'll just randomly go through and pick these questions and answer them on, on our hundredth episode. And we got a lot of great questions and we got a lot of duplicate questions. They're all very serious questions. We were hoping like, Garrett, what do you like to drink for beer in the morning? Um, <laughs> things like that. But like, we got nothing like that. Yeah. We said nothing's off limits and we got a lot of like really good business related questions, which is the whole point here, of course, but we said no, nothing's off limits. And we were like, I wonder what people are going to ask. And it was, well, I mean, people are focused on improving their business. So, Hey, that's what we'll do. It's all very serious. It's good though. We'll, we'll run with it. And then if anybody wants to throw in some random questions for the 200th episode, we'll uh, answer whatever you guys have. <laughs> um, I don't drink beer in the morning, by the way. So just <laughs> clarify that real quick. <laughs> um, so, uh, so we're going to run down to these questions. And Matt, uh, are you ready to go? I'm, I'm ready to go. Yeah, let's, let's rock and roll. Let's do this. All right. There's one here that jumped off the page to me because I, I feel that it comes up um, for a fair amount of people when they're trying to set goals, especially uh, in business planning. They come out of an installation and they go, you know, we hear about this value per contact of a thousand dollars per name in my database. And is that true? And and then somebody and then when they wrote the question, they said, is it one thousand or 2000. And I think that there's, a, there's some clarity that needs to happen around this. And um, I'm happy jumping on this grenade first, and then we'll move forward. How's it sound, Matt? Yeah, let's do it. Because I think this is a, a common question. You know, when people look at different markets and different average price points and things like that, it's like, well, what, what is the true value of my contact? How does, where does that come from? The way I've looked at this for years is this model of $1,000 and the initial model is that every name in your database is worth $1,000. Well, it was built out of Fort Collins, Colorado, and it was built around the idea of the average selling price is right around 250000 because that's what it was when they kind of went into that model. So what you need to look at is, and this is the way I've always done it with the people that I coach, is that if your average selling price is 500000 guess what? Every name in your database is worth about 2000 If your average selling price, if you just kind of roll up through the ranks, if you're selling million-dollar homes, do the math. You know, Every name in your, your database might be worth $4,000. That's kind of how you want to look at it if you want to say, okay, with the people that I have, what is this worth to the business that I'm trying to grow and where do I want to get to? Um, that's how I've looked at it. it. That formula stayed pretty true for me when working with people. But it's funny when I have somebody sell a million dollar homes and they're like, I'm really out producing the thousand uh, dollars per name. And I'm like, well, yeah, your average selling price says you should be like that. <laughs> it kind of goes hand in hand. <laughs> yeah. You know, th there's a reason why that happens. And I think the other thing for people to understand is if you have a massive database and you're like, well, but how come I'm not earning the value that is in my database? And that's where this is if you are in great, this is what the opportunity of value is in your database. So you got to be in great flow. You got to work your ninja systems to to extract that value. Not that we should be pinning numbers on people, but 
if when it relates to your income, if you're out there and you're connecting with people and really getting in flow and operating your Ninja Nine with your database, this is you know approximately what you'll see. I had this vision of you saying pinning numbers on people, and I had this like, remember those old stamps that like you you like like it's like a tax account stamp. It goes cha ching like when you <laughs> had this like thousand dollar stamp, and you're like, hey Matt, nice to see you, and like stamp your forehead, be like, there we go, okay, who's the next one over here? Like thousand dollars. <laughs> it's like what's on my forehead? Like don't worry, you're fine, man. Just keep walking. <laughs> But I think with the thousand dollars per per person, Matt, you bring up a really good point that I watch people build these massive databases and go, well, I've got a thousand people in here. Like, does that mean I should be making a million dollars a year? And well, no, the reality of what we're talking about here is is that I like to lay that over your sphere of influence more than just the big old database. The people that you really know, like, trust, that's probably a more clear picture of where you're gonna see that that equation take place. And again, that can change a little bit because obviously there's fluff over into our database that's not necessarily in our sphere of influence that we maybe do have really, really good connections with. But um, mm-hmm. again, that, that's where it can get like the waters can get muddied up a little bit. So just be true that it's again, it comes back to really good flow with people is what makes those numbers work. Yeah. And I think if you already have a really good sized database, don't worry about the quote value per contact. I, I think the big reason why this is discussed is because if you have a small database, it helps you realize, well, hey, if I want to earn, you know, this level of income, I probably need to add some people to my database. And so that you can take that focus and put your energy towards meeting new people and growing that database. But if your database is already pretty robust and you're in good flow with those people, just focus on connecting with them more versus what quote each contact might be worth. Yeah. And, and it is funny how many times I've watched people go like, well, isn't that a coincidence? I made 200,000 last year and I have 200 in my database. <laughs> like, hmm, like it's it, when you're really doing the systems well, you will have those, those moments of clarity where you're like, and that's the formula. Yep. I had that conversation yesterday, actually, with somebody. <laughs> He's like, oh, this is funny. I was like, yeah, it is funny. It's a, I always tell people, we don't make this stuff up. Like It's not like we just sit around and be like, hmm, let's just throw some ideas at the wall and we'll present them to people. Larry did a lot of work on this stuff to make sure that all this stuff correlates out. And the, if you find the correlation, it's not a coincidence. It's because it's a formula. Yeah, absolutely. Well, and I think this leads into another question here, which kind of helps you execute on this is, what does focus on your hot list and warm list daily really mean? And I mean, it means that you should be looking at <laughs> your hot list and your warm list and and not just looking at it, meditating on those names, thinking about those people. What are the pain and pleasure moments in their life right now? What's the reason of life change that's causing them to be on the hot list or warm list? Those are the types of things that you should be doing when you are looking at your hot list and warm list every day. Yeah. One of the ninjas that I used to work with, uh, I loved how he used to do it. And he would take the hot list out and he'd sit down and say, who on here can I write a contract with this week? Who here on this list, if I ask the right questions, if I spend the right time with, if I can get clarity on where they are and where they want to go, who can I write a contract on this week? And he would just basically star the people's names or make a notation next to them saying, okay, these are my these are my contracts this week, technically. And then he would look at the warm list and the warm list daily, he would look at and say, who today or this week can I help alleviate pain in their life or increase pleasure in their life? And I always say with the warm list, it may have nothing to do with real estate at all. It might be sending them flowers. It might be dropping food off at their house uh, because of, you know maybe they're going through a really rough time right now. Those are those things you want to be looking at daily in your hot and your warm list and coming up with action items for the week of how you can improve or help people get to where they want to improve life or help them get to where they want to go. Yep, absolutely. I think it's as simple as that. And um, I just realized... Garrett, too. We should probably tell people like what we'll do <laughs> is in the show notes, uh, write down the questions and the timestamp during this episode so that you guys can also go back and sift through and say, hey, wait, where was this question asked and answered? So we'll put that in the show notes uh, so that you guys can look at that and say, oh, this question's at minute 
you know, 10, this question's at minute 12 or whatever it is. So, yeah. And some of these questions, by the way, Matt, we talked about it before. Some of these are entire podcasts. Yeah. So we're, some of these, we, we want to answer the question. We're going to go into it. Some of these, we might stop and be like, and we're going to do a whole podcast about this one down the road here because we'll answer it. But some of these have just, there's tons of information to go around it. Yeah. And if for some reason we don't get to a question, some of you have asked some questions. If we don't answer it or address it during this, we will eventually. It'll either become a podcast or or we've already maybe addressed it and we'll point to it. So uh, don't worry. You guys will get answers. <laughs> Do I get to pick the next question? Yes, go. Pick one. Pick a good All one. Right. <laughs> I love this one because I'm not sure if it was actually like, I, I want to, would y'all... Y A L L. Y'all, come uh, on, man. This is this is the South. I get it. I, I know where the question came from. <laughs> Would y'all consider bringing a top producing ninja, uh, bringing top producing ninja agents in and chatting with them on a few episodes? Yes. Uh, we've discussed this a little bit over the time, and you know, it's funny as we've kind of kept to this model of you know, really looking at like the day to day, what's kind of happening out there and how do you overcome, you know, kind of challenges and different stuff that we see out there uh, in business. But uh, yes, I have gone down the route of wouldn't it be fun to bring on top producers and talk about them. The other thought about that is um, uh, Peter Parnegg uh, at the group, uh, sorry, with the Ninja Selling. Peter Parnegs, he's a ninja instructor, teaches installations all over the United States. He also does a lot of the media for Ninja Selling on the backside. And that is something that he has actually talked with me about, a kind of a pet project for himself, is talking with very top producing ninja agents, interviewing them. And so uh, kind of trying to stay in our lane. And I want to make sure that we can all like kind of bring our own pieces of value to the table. And uh, Peter specifically mentioned doing that. And I'm, I'm hoping that he's going to start doing more of those and getting those out. But we might also throw one in here, here and there. We, we'll see how that works. Yeah, let's do that. We are, I think the big reason uh, why maybe we haven't yet is, uh, well, we, we've been busy. <laughs> <laughs> and we are we are working on planning ahead and and getting some invites out and scheduling those things up. We've had a lot of fun on the interviews we have done. Yeah, and I think what we I think if we're going to go down that route and do it, let's. Um, I'm looking at some of the uh, the people that we're currently coaching who are just running some incredible businesses. I I'm going to reach out to them. They're my first picks, and let's see how they're doing and see if they want to talk too. Most people do. Um, some people are freaked out about podcasts and being recorded and being out there live. So uh, we just kind of make sure that they. They're up for it. <laughs> Absolutely. Okay. Let's do another one here. I'm going to pick this one. I know you highlighted this one for you too, Garrett. So this could be a good one for both of us, especially since we have kids at different stages of life. But best practices in doing the morning routine first thing when you have kids slash get to work early. Great question. And um, well, Garrett, I'll let you answer first. Oh, throw me out there. Uh, so... <laughs> We got to change it up. I'm going to pick the question and go. Uh, <laughs> so, so with the you know, with the best practices of the morning routine, first thing um, I have found, I've had to kind of go through changes in my life as my kids have you know gotten older and older and older. I've got a 12 year old and two 15 year olds right now, and uh, I find that I actually my morning routine now is easier than it's ever been. But I also get up really early. Um, I'm typically up by five o'clock and my day has started. I don't, I don't sleep in very well anymore, but I've interesting. I found that that not sleeping in has actually been trained. Um, I used to always tell people like, I love sleeping in. I like getting up when the sun comes up and in this last year and a half, uh, completely have changed my mindset about that, uh, through affirmations and through finding purposes of why I want to get up in the morning, getting excited about it. So I'm a big believer in, you know, if you can get up before everybody else. Yeah. Uh, there's a great video that Casey Neistat, and if anybody has never watched this, Casey Neistat, uh, he's a vlogger. And he's got one that's, if you just type in Casey Neistat 4 a.m. into YouTube, that's one of the videos that changed my mind about the morning hours and how best to use my hours and getting up before everybody else does. And he's got little kids, obviously not a real estate agent, but he's got the kids. So to kind of put that into perspective, but there were moments in my life when I was, you know, 
making breakfast and getting kids going and getting everybody up and having to do all that kind of stuff. And I found that I actually had to take care of a lot of that morning routine after I got them where they needed to go. I would take about a half an hour for myself to work through my gratitudes, my affirmations, uh, take all those pieces that I want to get done. So you need to be flexible. I think some people like just go like, this is the way it's got to be. It's got to look this way all the time. And then when a distraction or some other outside energy comes in, it's like, oh, it's all messed up. It's like, no, Bob and we have changed a little bit. Like, let's figure out how we can make it work. And you've got to approach it that way. Yeah, I agree. I it, My morning routines have changed from time to time. And now with a six month old, I mean, for right now, I I think the way you look at your day, if you don't have other things already planned into your day, like your exercise and certain things, then the morning becomes the only time that I think it can be productive to get it done. You know, your brain is refreshed. You're ready to go. I think the hardest thing that people battle with with getting up early is it's not comfortable. I've been waking up pretty early for a while. I'm not even waking up as early as I used to. But getting up at 4 a.m. is not fun. (laughs) People are like, oh, you must love getting up early. I'm like, not really. But... I really enjoy the time to myself to be able to work on my mindset, work on gratitudes, work on my physical fitness because once because I enjoy the family time too. I enjoy spending time and eating breakfast with my family in the morning and that's important to me. So if I want that to happen, I have to shift things. And I think that's the way we need to look at it. I think everybody can look at it and say what are the important things in my day that I don't want to change right now? that are going to be there? What are the things that I want to do in the morning? What are the common things that might derail me? And know that those things are going to happen. So then you need to look for other times when you can make the, that routine happen. And now, if, if it's waking up earlier than you currently do, and you're like, well, I need sleep, then going to bed earlier becomes something that we need to look at as well. Yes. And going to bed earlier, your your evening routines that you have are, are amazing. You wonder why you have a hard time getting up in the morning. First thing to look at is what is my evening routine? When do I eat? You know, do I drink too much? Do I, I mean, there's all kinds of pieces that you put in and then you go like, well, it's so hard for me to get up in the morning. Yeah. Well, just take crap care of yourself at night. Like that's part of what happens. The miracle morning, one of the best pieces I found in there for changing the way that I wake up in the morning is going to bed telling yourself how good you're going to feel when you wake up in the morning and that my body will get exactly the amount of sleep that it needs to be able to make me feel amazing in the morning. Oh, I'm so happy you brought that up. That was a big game changer for me too. Oh, the mantra of just going to bed going like, oh, I'm going to feel so incredible when I wake up tomorrow and I'm looking forward to waking up early, getting just the amount of rest that I needed so I can be successful in this day and feeling amazing. And it's like all of a sudden you pop out of bed going like, I feel pretty damn good. Yeah. Well, what did I change? I just told myself different when I went to bed because everybody else is going to bed going, oh, I'm going to bed a little late. You know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be tired tomorrow and I'm going to be, I hate it when I'm tired and feeling exhausted and and it's like, oh, it's just, I can't wait. I don't want the alarm to come. And all through the night, you're sitting there, sitting there going, oh man, I only have two more hours to sleep and I'm going to be tired. And it's a different mindset. Like I find myself now waking up in the middle of the night and I look at the alarm and maybe I'm having a hard time sleeping. I just say to myself, for some reason, my body didn't need that much sleep tonight. And I'm still going to get just the amount of sleep that I need to be able to be high functioning tomorrow. Mm-hmm. And just changing that mindset as you're sitting there in that moment. Yeah. You know, it's the evening routine and what you do in the evening. You mentioned taking crap care of yourself. I mean, so I have one of these uh, whoop straps uh, that I wear and been testing out and I, I've been kind of interested in what the no. results are. Um, what is a whoop strap? I don't want to go down a black hole. Here. What are you talking about? So it's basically like a really high tech heart rate monitor. It's called W H O O P. It's like a fitness tracker, but it tracks your cardiovascular activity and it tracks your sleep and everything. Um, look it up and you can <laughs> figure what it's all about, but it tells you how well you slept and how well your body cardiovascularly is recovered. And interestingly enough, they, and they have you answer a questionnaire every morning. And one of the questions is, did you have two or more alcoholic beverages within two hours before you went to sleep? And I was like curious. I'm like, how? Wonder how much that one component really impacts my cardiovascular recovery. Keeping everything else the same, it's drastic. Really? Yes. The nights where I have nothing, recovery is always way better than a night that I have even just a couple, like a drink or two drinks, closer to bedtime. It 
is amazing that that impact has. And I think this is where a big mindset, because a lot of times we'll be thinking, oh, well, it'd be nice to just have a beer and decompress. And that's where I've like asked myself, well, what's important to me? Having a quote drink and decompressing or being able to get up and conquer the day tomorrow. And that's a, you know, that's a little mindset shift. So the term conquering the day is what I was curious about coming back to, because in that video that Casey Neistat puts out, one of the pieces that really resonated with me and why he gets up at 4 a.m. And he doesn't get up at 4 a.m. He gets up. It, it just needs to be in the four o'clock hour. So as long as he's up before that clock hits five, he feels like it's success. And he says, if I can get up and I can take care of these activities, and believe me, it's not the ninja morning routine that he's following. He's hammering out stuff that's weighing over his head and getting it done. He feels that by six o'clock when his kids are up, he's already made this day be successful. This day has already been a win in his life because he's taken this action before the rest of the world. And and he also makes the comment that before that time, when you're up that early, social media is not going, emails aren't going, your phone's not ringing. Like it is you time one hundred percent. And you have to look at it that way, that if you're going to get up that early, it's not just to be up before the sun rises. It's not just to like, you know, piddle around with the time. Like it is a hundred percent constructive you time that you get to take if you want to own that. And that that's what I, um, I feel about the morning routine. And we kind of deviate out this again. This is a whole nother podcast, but we kind of deviated down there. But <laughs> yeah, I was thinking, I'm like, hmm, this one, this question, this but it, it is a really important question. And I think there's there's even more to it, and I'm sure we'll create a specific podcast about morning routines, and that one will probably be an hour long. So, But hopefully this helps. I think this helps answer a lot of questions that people have about morning routines. And yeah, it's going to be a little uncomfortable in the beginning when you start to change that, but you have to understand what you're trying to accomplish, and that'll help you get past the discomfort so that you can make it awesome. Yes. Okay, I have a next question here. What is the single most important thing that you can do every day to grow your business? Matt, go. <laughs> I just wanted to do it to you. I just wanted to do it to you. <laughs> and go. Um, talk to people. The single most yeah. important thing you can do is connect with your database. Actually, I was thinking about this and talking to a few people about this when it comes to business planning because we're in that time of year right now and everybody looks at like, okay, what can I do with my marketing and all this and everything? And it's like, you know, marketing is important. Absolutely. But if you're not talking to people, then it's not important anymore. Um, because talking to people and making connections and building relationships is the single most important thing that you can do for any business, not just your real estate business, any business, particularly any business that involves sales, which is pretty much every business. Talking to people, building relationships, getting into your database. Someone wrote on their business plan, I love it, as one of the top five things they can do to increase revenue, live in the database. And that to me is the single most important thing you can do every day. Yeah, I find that uh, the single thing that you need to do, Matt, just like you, get out and be around people. Real estate is a contact sport. And as you said, this is not just real estate related. Uh, This is mortgage. This is you know, any business that you ever want to create. Now you could be that little restaurant that opens up down the street and you can be that restaurant owner that goes and walks and meets all the other business owners in that you know vicinity to meet them and find out about how they ran their business and what made them successful and build relationships and, con- and connect. It doesn't matter what it is that you do. You want to be successful. You need to be out there talking to people. We see agents all the time that go like, well, my business isn't really growing. And the minute you start to really dissect their day, it's like, how many hours are you spending in the office? Like waiting for something to happen? Like that's not how business works. That's not how relationships work. You've got to be out moving around. And um, you got to take that opportunity. Tammy Spaulding, I used to love it where she's like, I never had a database when I first started. She goes, I used to just go to the mall and act like a buyer. She goes, people talk to you when you, when you act like a buyer. And I'm like, that's pretty smart. And then I took that and I walked the local stores down our, uh, down our, uh, uh, the town that I was selling real estate in. And we'd walk, just walk down, meet all the owners of the stores, meet the people that were working in there. And that was one of my ways that I started to build my database and grow my business. But it was never sitting in the office. I shared an office with somebody. I maybe sat in the chair in my office. I, I would literally exaggerate and say probably 20 times. 
over the time that I sold real estate. I didn't want to be in there. It was a waste of my time to be in there. I needed to be out moving around talking to people. Yeah. One of our one of our good friends that we have here in Charleston, we met the first couple of months we were here, sold us a table, walked into the store, started chatting, got connected. Uh, we're going to brunch with them actually this weekend. <laughs> That's how it happens. It's amazing. Yeah. All right. Next question. Uh, Garrett, you really like this one. So I'm going to, I'm going to read this one and, and toss it to you because, and this one comes from, from Russell Smith. I love the questions that Russell brings. No is a complete sentence. And what he's saying is, is do you agree with a lot of successful people like Warren Buffett who say you need to be able to say no to most requests? And I know that there's um, some content out there. I think Clara Capano actually created a video and a blog for Ninja talking about how to say no and why you should say no. So Garrett, do you agree that no is a complete sentence? Yeah, I think that uh, it's interesting is, I mean, obviously I don't want you guys out there just going, no, like you got to have some energy behind and reasoning behind you saying no. But I do think that it's a, it's a skill that most more people need to get okay with. And I think that in Ninja in general, a lot of us go into Ninja because we do love our people and we love relationships. And a lot of times what comes with that very much wanting to be a pleaser and to really connect with people is we have a harder time saying no sometimes. I watch it all the time. The answer yes comes out way too frequently because we go, well, that's what then that's maybe what ninja is is saying yes and taking care of people and helping them. But really, uh, one of my favorite sayings is say no so you can say yes. Mm -hmm. And as you go through, let's say we're working with buyers, uh, you know, when you do the 10 step buyers process, part of that, I refer to it as like a game of like red light, green light. As you're asking all those questions, you're asking yourself also, is this an environment that I want to put myself into? And there might be a point in there that we have to say no, that we can't work with them. Uh, they're not willing to go do what it takes to be ready to be a buyer. They're not clear on where they want to go. We need to find more clarity. Uh, there's all kinds of reasons that are, or maybe there's a massive pain that they're dealing with that nobody's like, it's kind of like the elephant in the room that no one's willing to look at. And until they figure it out, there's no way they're going to buy a house. Those are certain things that you need to be able to say no to. Same thing with listings. When you do the pre-listing interview, part of that is to help them find clarity. Part of that is also for you to realize the situation that you're getting into and saying, is this a listing that I really want? And I always tell people like, you know, we list sellers, we don't list homes. Part of this ability of you saying no is that when you find yourself going into a listing and you're listing a house and not a seller, this is your opportunity to be like, maybe I should say no to this one because sellers will always make you happy. If you find yourself listing too many homes, they can lead you to upset and uh, <laughs> frustration and sleepless <laughs> nights. Oh yeah, and those are just so you know. And I, this is a whole other podcast, but you know that is when you find yourself listing homes, you know you've listed a house when you're going. They won't do a price reduction. They won't do anything that I'm asking them to do, um, and it's frustrating. And they're mad at me, and this home isn't going to sell. You listed a house. Yeah. You should have said no. You should have figured that out up front, and we should have said no. So I think. No is wonderful and it needs to be used. It's not negative. It literally is a positive to help you help more people. Absolutely. And I think that's the way you have to look at it when you are saying no, because I think there, you know, this is not a open door to just say no to things, right? Like, oh, no, no, I'm going to stick to the things that I want. No, 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 no. It's like, okay, well, that's that's a lot of negative energy going into it. We want to look for the positive energy to bring to the word no. You know, for example, saying no to the snooze button so that you can get up in the morning and start your day. Actually, one of the best uses of the word no, I think comes in the commission discussions too. And I talked to an agent who completed an installation. This was last year. And I loved what she said. She said, I've already increased my revenue coming out of the installation. I said, what did you do? She said, well, I just started saying no when people asked me to reduce my commission. I used to always just be like, yeah, well, maybe we can work something out. And I just simply say, no, full stop. No. <laughs> like, and she's like, and people just said, okay. I was like, that's, that's great. It's the, the two-year-old model for negotiating commission. Yeah. Uh, would you like to reduce your commission? No. 
All right, then, like moving along. Yeah. <laughs> Stuff like that really does work. I mean, this is why you guys have a process. You have a program. You have value. If you're displaying the value and doing all the things right, and we're assuming that you are, then when it comes to that, you can say no. And most people will say, okay, great. Let's go. Where do I sign? It, it really is crazy. Speaking, going back to commission here, and I don't want to leave that for a second. It, I have watched that happen with so many people that the minute they learn and get comfortable with saying no when it comes to reducing their commission, they're like, they were okay with it. Like they just went with my fee. The, it, the National Association of Realtors did a study. Uh, it comes out of the uh, profile of home buyers and sellers. And uh, Matt, do you remember the percentage of realtors that actually were responsible for starting the negotiation? On commission? Oh, it was it was really high. I mean, I can definitely go look it up, but I mean, it was well over sixty percent. Yeah, I was going to say it was up in the seventies to eighties almost. When they said who really initiated the negotiation on commission, it was actually the realtors that started the negotiation on it. So it's funny is is I think that your your real reason why you're going to have to say no is not as high as you think, um, and uh, don't go there, but. Well, I think it's it's not worrying about having to clarify things too, right? Because I mean, well, the, the commission negotiation, most realtors would go, well, my fee is this, but, and that's where it all starts to go downhill. But I think when also when people are looking to say no to maybe a request because you already have your hour of power schedule and someone's asking for that time and you, you don't really want to feel, you want to sometimes you feel bad, I guess, saying no, even though you have that appointment scheduled with yourself. And I think you have to first just have the confidence to say, you know, it's okay to say no. And you don't have to clarify that, well, I have this and this to do. Just suggest something else and just take control of how the time works. I do think you can get better at saying no if you have a clear reason also behind why you say no. Like we have people call me all the time and they're like, I have a group of 10 agents in my office and can you can we do a Skype and have you coach them and we can work and work with this group? And my answer is no. And the reason behind it is not because I don't have time to do it. It's because I don't see the results in it. And mm -hmm. if I don't see the results in it, it's a waste of everybody's time. So the answer is no. And we have other options that we have that produce really good results. And I think it, you, you can get away with saying no if you can then back it up with your reasoning behind why you're saying no and why that you saying no to it is actually a value to them. Taking a buyer out who's not ready to buy, I'm going to say no to that. And the reason I'm going to say no is you guys are going to find your dream home and have your heart broken because you can't buy it. Yes. Yes. Oh, so good. I mean, so we could probably do a whole episode on, on no and yes. <laughs> just, just keep starring these. Just highlight them different colors when we're like, X, that's another podcast. Yeah, another <laughs> podcast. Great question. And I think that a, a, a lot of people don't um, use that to their advantage enough. And so I would recommend you ex you all explore it kind of personally and how you want to go about saying that and and deploy it into your business because it will help you create more success for your clients. This is not just about you. This is about them and saying no will help the people that you're working with. Yes. My question, your turn, <laughs> my turn. <laughs> <laughs> What's the sweet spot generally for in-person meetings per week? Ooh, that is a good question. I'm, I'm guessing this is like how many yeah, I've got a couple of ways we can go about this because this is a very personal type thing. It is. It is. I will say, in terms of numbers, I actually had somebody text me this question last night, not related to the podcast, but just literally, hey, am I doing enough in-person meetings? And we have in the weekly routine, two per week, two lunches, coffees per week. That's a one-on-one. -on -one. And so at, at the basic level, I'd say if you can get two a week, you're doing good. Yeah, if you get two a week, you're doing good. If you know, if you include, if you wanted to include the real estate reviews in there, so that would that would push it up to four. You're 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 killing it. Like that would be a great, great, great ratio. Just to say, look, th this works. Now, I have told people for years that you can make up for certain things in certain areas by doing other things more. And I have an agent that like has owned the face to face meetings. And he does six lunches a week. Now, when I say six lunches a week, that's coffee, that's lunch, that's breakfast, that's maybe going for a beer after work. And he just, just puts all these people in and he just makes sure he fills all these holes. 
that is what has made his business just flourish. He's got a, data, a sphere of influence of about 40 people. I just saw his business plan. He did 82 sides. 32 of them, I think, if I remember correctly, were direct referrals last wow. year. That's awesome. Um, yeah. I mean, and, and he's like, my my lunches, my face-to-face is what drives my business and what makes, makes my business happen. So to say, is there a sweet spot? Uh, yeah, the more the better. Uh, but I, th- it's also time consuming. Not everybody can pull that off. And it, there's lots of things that happen when you start, you'll, you'll hit a zone in there where you're like, oh my gosh, like, I feel like every time I'm going anywhere, like I'm sitting down for lunch or I'm doing this. And, and I know I'm talking fast here. It's funny because I'm out of tea. But <laughs> the, um, <laughs> the, the other part you got to look at is, is that if you do more face to face, you're in that zone of more quality than quantity. And you got to find that kind of happy medium for you and your database. Some people are more quality than they are quantity of people. And some people are, hey, I'm going to do two lunches and I'm going to make a lot of other touches through phone calls and uh, my notes and through other places that I'm not going to be face-to-face. And super high quality there too, but it's just different. There's nothing better than face-to-face. Yeah. And face to face being also one on one. I think don't don't confuse going to a big party and seeing lots of people as the same as having lunch with one person or one or two people. Um, Not that parties aren't bad. They're great. Actually, they're fantastic. The more you can do of that as well, I think the better for you, too. But getting one on one, there's a mortgage broker I know in New Jersey, Mark Eses, didn't study Ninja, but has a lot of his business built on face-to-face, one-on-one connections, and his business is great. And it, I think it comes a lot from his ability to do some great networking, get out, have coffees, lunches, and just connect with people. That's the other thing. When you're doing these in-person meetings, it's about connecting with them, not just talking to them so that they can buy or sell real estate. It's literally to connect with them and build those relationships. Yeah, and that you know, it's interesting when you talk. Yeah, you Matt, you brought about you know this is one on one is what we're talking about. I have an agent in uh, uh, Kirkland, Washington, and one of the things events that he just did was a wine tasting party, and he invited sixty people down, and and we did the math on it. It was about a three hour event, everybody hanging out, having a good time, talking, and he's like, it was, and, he, and it's a it's a wonderful event for him. He gets amazing results for it. But at the end of the day, I did the math on it. If at best the best he could do, it was three minutes per person. That That's the interaction he got if he spread it all out equally. And that's not the way that it worked. I guarantee you there's somebody sat there and talked with for 15 to 20 minutes and then moved over to somebody else. So there was a group of like five people there where you're really not having a one-on-one conversation. It's kind of spread out amongst a group of people. It's just different. And you, again, there's that one-on-one where you can directly look in somebody's eyes, learn about them, talk about them. Um, that's where the most power is going to come out of for most people. So, mm-hmm. yeah, I agree. I agree. So let's see here. Moving, moving on. Um, ooh, I like uh, this question here. I think this is a fun one. Is there a ninja way to set up an open house? Yes, there is. Are you going to throw this my way or are you going to take this one? Well, I, I mean, I guess... Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I guess we could change the yeah, format. Yeah, no, I'll take it. Different ways. Let me jump. In. I mean, my answer is Let yes. Let me jump in real there quick. Is. <laughs> yeah, there is, and uh, you know, it's funny is that you know the the old traditional way of setting up an open house is you know maybe you run an ad in the paper, maybe you run on social media, say hey we're having an open house over here. Maybe you buy Facebook ad and you put it out so the world can see it. Maybe in surrounding areas, you got your sign out. Gotta have balloons, guys. I'm just having fun. Sorry. Um, <laughs> But <laughs> put the signs out, open the doors up. But I think that, you know, when you start to get into the ninja way, uh, you need to have a very, very, very specific plan of how you help people maneuver through that house. You need to have very specific questions. The three-step introduction, I have found people have said, if I just introduce the three-step introduction, which comes out of ninja, to when somebody walks into my open house, the way they interact with me is a completely different level. Um, I've had people say that if they, instead of just saying, come on in, walk around the house and enjoy yourself. If they can control that situation a little bit and say, you know, three-step introduction and then invite them into the kitchen or into a social, like a local, sorry, a localized part of the house and kind of give a little bit of a presentation of what this house is. And, you know, is this the type of, you know, ask them some questions. 
what are they looking for in a house? Get to know them a little bit. And then you say, now go and enjoy the house. If you set it up like that, what we've found is they will come back and talk to you before leaving. And everybody always goes like, oh, they always run out the door. And usually they always run out the door because of the actual first like two to three minutes of how we engage them when they walked into the house. And they're like, let's get through this thing quickly and get out of here before the realtor sees us. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Because they're outside doing their game plan saying, hey, there's a realtor in there. Remember, we're just looking. And if they ask, we already have somebody. <laughs> this is scary, man. <laughs> and so, Gary, you mentioned the three-step introduction, which is enroll, acknowledge, then your name. A lot of people put the name first, and that's where you're subtly shifting the focus towards yourself than the other people. Hi, how are you? Welcome to 123 Main Street. Lovely jacket that you have on today. By the way, my name's Matt. Here's some information about the house. If you have any questions, let me know. That is a much more comfortable way to introduce people. But I think, too, to be able to set yourself up to have wonderful conversations, I think you have to physically be set up to have an awesome open house, too. Don't just go into be like, I'll get some showing sheets and some stuff like there. Have everything ready to go to answer any questions that anyone might have. Have you know, general buyers packets ready, have pre-listing packets ready because there's going to be a lot of sellers, potential sellers coming into those open houses too. Have great counter display, all the information about the home, information about the area, schools, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Put the balloons out front. I mean, <laughs> one, of those little blow, one of those little blow up guys. It's like, oh, what are those, what are like for the car dealerships? Oh man, I love those. <laughs> <laughs> hey, nobody's tried that yet, at least not that I know of. Hey, you can be a first out there. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, I think you have to have be physically set up so that you can then simply focus on building a relationship when people come in. Yes. I also want to add one last thing in, which is the realtor's personal mindset about open houses before the open house ever starts. Mm -hmm. If you want to have a successful way to set up an open house, one of my, I talk about them on the podcast all the time, but a lot because I've coached them for a long, long, long time. Uh, Randall O'Dowd in Seattle is one of the best open house agents I've ever seen. And if you hear him talk about open houses, he doesn't just go like, I'm going to do an open house this weekend. He will say to you, I'm doing an open house this weekend because I kill open houses and I get leads and I get buyers and I get sellers through my open houses every single time. Mm -hmm. That's how he talks about the open house when he's setting it up. I look back when I used to sell real estate. I was like, I'm doing an open house this weekend and I'm going to bring a whole bunch of reading material and other crap with me so that when I get bored and nobody's coming, I have stuff to do. Yes. And that's the way a lot of people <laughs> think about it. And it's, and it's really not great. I mean, because then people come in, I'm sure we've been there. I've been there where I'm sitting in an open house reading something and somebody walks through the door and like you look up and you've been staring down at this page or your device for so long that you got to like, you have blurry vision now. People come in and you're kind of confused. Like, that's not good. <laughs> We don't, we don't want that. You mean you mean you have to set solitaire down for a second? <laughs> Sorry, that was that's bad. Apologize to everybody. That's that's the old stuff. Now it's uh, well, I guess Angry Birds isn't as popular as it used to be anymore either. So maybe you're scrolling through TikTok. <laughs> <laughs> but I think that, you know that that mindset of how you go into it because again, uh, when you go into the mindset of I, I love this activity, I get leads, you know, because I guarantee you. And here's here's the thing to think about when your mindset's like that. I guarantee you, I looked at the open houses differently that I could pick from either in my listings or helping other agents out. Where Randall looks at them and he sees opportunities where leads come in and people are going to show up to these houses and what type of homes people actually want to go look at on the weekend, where I look at it as, all right, open houses. I like that one. I'll pick that one. And subconsciously, I'm actually picking one that nobody was going to want to come to and it's going to be quiet and I'm going to have you know, to sit there by myself. There's so many factors that go into it that create the good open house. I love it. Let's uh, keep moving this forward. Garrett, I think it's, I think it's your turn to pick. Hmm. All right. What is the best way to come up with a mission statement? Ooh. This is a this is a good question, a good detailed question. And, and Gary, you brought it up on the business planning workshop where you really can have two mission statements, right? You can have an external and an internal mission statement. And I think we see a lot of external mission statements 
that people put on their business plans and not enough internal mission statements, I would think. I think there's not enough mission statements that I see that are tied to what that individual wants to see in their life and what is connected to their whys very strongly. And I think that's where starting with your why can definitely help build that internal mission statement. Yeah, I'm actually a bigger believer in the internal mission statement, which there are less of them written out there. Uh, because in, 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 you know, an external mission statement tells the world what your purpose is and what your mission is with your business. The internal mission statement is for you to be clear about what your mission is with this business. And it will change the way that you approach this world. It will change the way you have your evening routine set up so that you can get a good night's sleep because your mission is getting up and owning the mornings so that you can be successful and purposeful with your days. Your mission may be about your providing for your family and creating you know, financial wealth and security for this, you know, these people that you've brought into your life. It, your mission statement um, is very, very, very personal. So I always lean to the internal mission statement first. And the specific tool that I like for the mission statement is actually looking at it as, uh, uh, sorry, getting into it with the, uh, the life list, to do, to be, to have, to give. If you ever find yourself stuck and not able to figure out, okay, what is my mission? Make your list, your life list, you know, make a vision board and sit down for a second and say, what resonates with this whole thing? What is this all about? And that's like for my mission statement has always been about, and, and hopefully it always will be in, on some different level, but it's about spending as much time as I possibly can with the people that I love and creating a business that allows me to have amazing adventures and amazing life and teach these people, these little people, the world through getting them out and seeing things and being involved. And that's where my mission statement is all about. So kind of what led me into coaching is having, you know, this, you know, giving me tons of time to be able to walk away because I can take coaching and go to another country if I want to, and nobody knows. But that fits my mission statement for myself. Your mission statement, as I tell people all the time, which makes people stop and go like, I don't think I found the right mission statement, so don't get stuck on this. But I think your mission statement, if thought about long enough with enough energy behind it, could potentially bring a tear to your eye. Yeah, I like I like and I like what you said there too, is like don't get stuck on it. Um, because I think people can come up with their whys. I'm seeing a lot of good whys on business plans this time of year. And you can always just pull on that. That could you can extrapolate that into a mission statement. It doesn't necessarily have to fit into a nice sentence. Um, sometimes it it may not. You may your mission statement may be your internal mission statement may be more of a feeling, which I think if you can uh, put that into words, it actually helps. I if you look at a lot of big CEOs and companies and people who we you know deem successful based on what they're doing out there. You see a lot of them sharing what their internal mission is and the things that make them feel good. And I think that's part of this too, is that don't be afraid to let your personality blend into your business because I think that's what makes you unique and what makes your business special. Because if you're really focused on achieving your internal mission statement, you know that you're going to have to definitely accomplish and crush your external mission statement to make that happen, which is going to help you provide even more value and service. Like helping the mission statement that I see, you know, often or that we hear people put together is like, well, I, I, you know, to help people buy and sell real estate, you know, with excellence or something like that, which is great. I think that's awesome. But if that in a vacuum does not excite you, we have a problem. Yeah. And we need to find something that gets you yes. like pumped to wake up because Helping people buy and sell real estate with excellence for me is not getting me out of bed at 4 a.m. It's just not. And it's going to be part of what I do if I'm, a re you know, if I'm listing and selling real estate. It's going to be part of what I do to achieve my internal mission statement, which is dominate life with excellence, my life, you know, to provide exceptional experiences for my family and the people around me so that I can serve more people even better. Now that is something that can get me excited to get out of bed in the morning. I hope that that makes sense. So let me, I, I never thought about it this way, but an external mission statement, one that you share with the public is, well, let, let me actually take a step back. Everybody who's been through Ninja has heard showings better than telling. And if you are doing external mission statements only, that is a telling everybody what your purpose is here and what's going on. An internal mission statement, getting very clear with it, allows you to do activities that will show people who you are. Ooh, 
I like that. Yeah. I'm I'm down for that. I could roll with that. That 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 that's where I think we should end that question with. <laughs> yeah, that's like the exclamation point on it. So perfect. That's that's the best way to come up with your mission statement. There you go. To continue on our mission, we have besides ninja, what else does an agent have to know or do to succeed? I.e., what is the taxonomy of the successful agent? Oh man, this is a this is a good one because I think this is kind of dances around a lot of things and conversations that people have about Ninja, particularly when people are in brokerages where they've, they've done an installation and then people are like, okay, how do we integrate this into what we do? Garrett, I know you agree with me on this. And the reality is, is that if you have Ninja, you have everything that you need. If you are following the Ninja path, that's all you need because that is designed to create incredible success. It really is like kind of an an all encompassing package. I mean, and I, and I it always laugh when you know people are like, yeah, yeah, I've got Ninja, but I'm also going to implement these other systems from this thing over here, and I'm also going to I want to bring this in, or I mean, actually, some of the act the areas that I watch that people flounder in a lot is that they will be doing Ninja and at the same time trying to do the other systems, and it like just. It, they don't they don't work well together. And as far as I'm concerned, is like every aspect of everything you need to be successful, and not just to be successful, to be stupid successful, is in the package of ninja selling. That's what I have. It's why I've followed it for as long as I have. It's why when I bumped into it, gosh, 20 years ago, um, it's why when my dad bumped into it, my dad was one of the original ones back in 1999 that bumped into Larry Kendall and went, this is the system that will save the real estate industry. My dad was a, a national CRS instructor uh, for many, many, many years, really looking for what was going to make the biggest impact in in the real estate world. And I think it's interesting that you bump into... Really? <laughs> It's okay. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> it is the Q and A episode, and nothing <laughs> off limits, including keeping our cell phones on. <laughs> Not anymore. So, yeah. So one of the things my dad, when he came across that, was like, "This is the system," and I think it's it's amazing as like even as Larry has approached it over the years, where people have said like, "Hey, can we take your system?" And use it just internally, just in our office. And Larry's mentality has always been, no, this is the system to save the real estate industry. Like it is the system that's going to make the change because it's all encompassing. You've got, you know, your goal setting in it. You've got all your systems on how to work with people. You have all your direction on how you're supposed to do your marketing. I mean, so really I'd say the only thing when people say, I want to look at like, what should I do be doing outside? You should find a good marketing tool for yourself. You should find a, a, a CRM that works really well for you. All the things that you would go to outside of Ninja are sometimes almost like services or tools that will make Ninja work for you in your industry or sorry, more so in your geographical area that you're in. But other than that, you got everything you need. You don't need to overthink this at all and add in more stuff. It, more stuff actually damages what I've seen. Yeah, and I think it's because Ninja is a is a philosophy. There is a philosophy, and then you have a buyer and seller system, and you have all of these other components in terms of how you do the five step calling process, the three step introduction. But then you have the philosophy, whereas a lot of other quote selling systems are, hey, just do this thing, you know, make these types of cold calls, use this script, and that's not what Ninja is. There are components that can help guide you through that, but when you have the philosophy, it'll help you identify the tool and services that can can build on that. And I think that's where where you're spot on, Garrett, is that if you're if you're looking for that, okay, what do we need to like latch on? Then that's just the tool, other tools that you need to make this work. You, do, you don't need to look for other um, concepts necessarily. So just die and I think that's actually one thing that maybe some people do miss. This is why I, I highly recommend people go to installations more than once, you know, maybe once every other year or every year. I know some people go every year because every time you go and you dig into the subject matter, you pull something new out of it and you you kind of have a new aha every time you go through. And that's the beauty of it. There's There's so much more in there than the first time you read the book or the first time you go through an installation. And so if you're looking for more, go back, go back into the book, reread the stuff. You're going to find more in there. 
You know, it's funny. One of the, one of the common things sometimes we'll hear is uh, people will come to us looking for new stuff, and we're like, "Well, you can go back to Ninja," and they're like, "No, no, no, no. We've already got that. We've already done that. We've already we've already been to Ninja," and and that's where I always like go like, "But are you doing?" the systems? Are you doing Ninja? Because again, if you chose to do the system rather than just look at it as like a, a class that we went to one time or we came in and had to talk to talk to our agents, if you really embrace it and run with it, y- again, you will see that you don't need any more. One of my favorite lines my dad used to say when he was teaching is that people would come in and say, okay, well, what do you got new for us today? And he would look at all of them. And I remember staying in the back of the room and watching him and say, how much more stuff do you want me to teach you that you're not going to do? <laughs> yeah like, like, wh- what are we doing here like i can in, in realtors are notorious for it of going like oh there's this new class on this or there's this new tool to bring in leads over here there's this new thing to do over here and they're always looking for that silver bullet they're always looking for that next thing that's going to like make their business just thrive and the reality is it's consistency and it's consistency with any of the systems out there any other coaching program that's out there by the way it's consistency with those two i just haven't seen one that as a whole life goal setting philosophical good feeling uh, i haven't found one like ninja ever and that's that's where i stand (laughs) i'm a little i'm a little biased though yeah well i'm on i'm on board with you on that one too (laughs) But consistency with this system would be what I would tell people instead of trying to add something in or look at something new, just be super consistent with every aspect of it. And you'll have goals beyond your wildest dreams or at least results. Yeah, absolutely. Well, you mentioned the word goal. And I think that's a great, you know, toss over to this question that we got from many, many different people in various forms, which is how do you decide the right goal? Um, Some people said, you know, I don't want to set something too high because I don't want to be disappointed. Other people are just saying, hey, I'm just not sure what should be the next step in my in my goal setting because I was I've been hitting my goal year after year. Is it too low? Um, How does that work? Do I need to set long term goals and then chunk it down into little goals? And so, you know, Garrett, you've been obviously working with goal setting with people for years and have gone through a lot of this. So I'm curious to hear like, what is, what is a great way? Is, is there a simplified way? Cause maybe I don't, maybe there isn't a simple way, but is there a simplified way to approach goal setting so that we can feel comfortable and excited about what we're going into the next year? Yeah, goal setting is a, uh, uh, <laughs> it's one of those things that I find can bog down a handful of people. Um, the reality of what I find is, is that if they're bringing their mind into it too much, which mind as also the term, which uses reality and that, that idea of reality and like, okay, well, what's a realistic goal for me? Well, reality comes from everything that your mind or you have personally been through, through the past and everything you've seen. And when you put a goal out there, your brain says, okay, is this realistic? Have I seen this before? Is this something that I think is possible? And I hate the word reality. Uh, it's one of those things that's like, yeah, I understand what you have been through in the past and understand that, but don't let that be the barrier that stops you from being able to move forward. So I always tell people, let the, let the past go. If you want to be able to really embrace a great goal that you put out there, one that is very, you know, I would say much bigger than where you, where reality says you might be able to be. However, though, if you put this big goal out there and every single time you look at it, your brain says that's not possible, we have a problem. So we need to find a goal. We need to find a goal for, for whoever we're working with or anybody who's listening to this out there that it walks that fine line of, whoa, like, oh, that's, that's big. But the other side of it that goes, but I think I can do it. And if you have those two pieces in there, you're 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 in a really good spot, like really good spot. But make sure that that I think I can do it isn't being hampered so hard by what do I think my reality is. Um, and that's a weird element to get people kind of bounce around in there. If you're really fighting with it, sometimes I'll have people that would take their goal and come at it from a different angle. So it's one thing to put out there and I'm going to use a big number here. The one that's on the sheet here is, uh, they were talking about like moving from what was the numbers on here, Matt? Uh, 120 uh, to 150. Yeah. 120 to 150. Now I'm going to, for just in 
my sake of my example here, it's going to be a little bit bigger number here. But I had an agent that was doing right around that 400 mark. And their goal was to move to 600. And every time he wrote down the goal 600, he had a panic attack. It like was just like, wow, like, I don't know oh, this is really big. I'm not sure I can do this. I'm not sure if this is possible. Well, I knew that earlier that year, he had had a $100,000 month. Now, it was one transaction. So there's a lot of stuff in self-talk that can bump into that going like, oh, but, but, but that was, that was, a, that was just kind of, I got lucky on this really big transaction. Like it was a $5 million home. That was the reason I made $100,000 that month because literally it was my commission check. Like, okay, but that's not, not realistic. Okay, great. So then I broke it down to saying, well, did you have any $50,000 months this year just based off of the, of the actual business you were doing? And he was like, well, yeah, I do. Actually, I can see that like on two months, I had $50,000 months. And I said, great. I said, run with that. That's the number that I want you to use and think about that. And he started to piece it together. I'm like, if you do that for 12 months, you'll be at 600,000. The fear of the 600,000 was freaking him out. The idea of doing $50,000 a month. Now he's obviously in a higher selling price area. But the 50000 per month, his brain, the reality brain shut off and the internal went, I've seen myself do that before. I can do $50,000 a month. Great. Let's do it consistently. You'll be at 600000 So I, ho- I hope that kind of it puts a, an idea of how I look at goal setting and what it is. And when you find that goal that's too – looks scary, sometimes you need to come at it from a different angle that will get you there by accident. And it might be like you start counting – you know, I need to sell X amount of bedrooms this year, but you correlate kind of how many bedrooms it's going to take to get you to three bedroom, four bedroom, two bedroom houses to get you to this goal of 150 that you want to get to where all of a sudden it's like, well, I can sell that many homes. I can help that many people. I can, I don't care how you come, want to come at it that make your brain all of a sudden go, I could do that. But th- that's what you need to do. But if that brain says that's impossible, I don't think it's possible that's where you got to start and we'll stop and step back, you know, a ways and say, okay, let's take a different look at this. Yeah. It's, it's really, I love that chunking it down and kind of figuring out different ways to approach potentially the same big number. It It is complicated. It can, or I should say it can get complicated for depending on where your mindset currently is and what work you're doing to change your mindset. Because to me, this comes into the category of scarcity versus abundance. When we're saying, hey, I don't want to set a goal so big because what happens if I miss it? And for me, I'm like, well, who cares if you miss it? You set a big goal and you miss it. You prob- yeah, you probably did pretty well. And there's still probably a lot you can learn and you can analyze and say, well, hey, how come I missed it? Well, there was that three week period where I wasn't making my phone calls and I wasn't writing my notes. And that l- probably led to a little bit of slowdown. I mean, so I think the first thing is, is know that if you set a big, big goal, it's okay if you don't hit it. What's And what's not okay is... It's taking away your effort from the actions that can get you there because you're scared. And I want I want you guys to have the confidence to overcome that fear because it it doesn't matter. You, there's a lot of other voices and other people out there, you know, that create that quote unquote reality, Garrett, that you're talking about. And people say, well, you gotta be real. You gotta be real. And it's like, no, everybody has a different perception on what reality is. And you can change your own personal reality by changing your internal mindset. And so I hope that when you look at a goal, you can start to think, hey, I need to approach it from a mindset of abundance instead of a mindset of scarcity. Well, I, I want to add this one last piece in is uh, nobody out there knows except for a handful of people. My dad's been dealing with cancer and he's actually cancer free as of right now. He's very, yeah, I just got that report, which is very exciting. Ooh, and um, I like that. And along with that is good news. Oh, it is good news. I guess we got a wonderful text uh, yesterday uh, letting me know what, how he was and where cancer stood in his life. But with that being said, brain cancer is not one that I th- feel like you can just go like, oh, yeah, I've got my clear scan. I'm like, oh, my gosh, that's 
we're, we're big time right now. So yeah, like this is like, Hey, everybody, like, let's have a party right now. <laughs> but three years ago when, when he was first diagnosed and I was sitting with him in the hospital and we were kind of talking about, you know, our, our journey that we've had together. And, um, I, we, it was right around business planning time. And we were talking about, I said, you know, it's interesting. I said, how crazy it is that people beat themselves up over the goals and they beat themselves up. And just, I mean, really the negative energy sometimes that comes off of people when, when they're getting into this whole goal setting thing, or even at the end of the year, when maybe they didn't hit a goal and they're just ripping themselves apart. And I was really frustrated by it. I was having like a lot of like internal stuff plus dealing with my dad. And I had a moment where I was, I was sharing that with him. And he said, he said, you know, the hardest thing to get people to see sometimes is to not get locked on the goal, but to enjoy the journey. He said, if you enjoy the journey along the way, the goal can never be a failure. Yeah. And the goal is just a goal. Just put the big goal out there. But what you need to make sure is that you're creating an environment and you're creating a, a, a set of systems and a plan for yourself that without a shadow of a doubt, you're going to be able to enjoy the journey. And that's where I would like to leave that one on is for all of you guys out there, it's one thing to set a big, nasty goal for yourself. And I love it. But if your plan is not set up to enjoy the journey, believe me, it will definitely feel like a massive failure if you come short of it. Uh, If you enjoy the journey, you'll never fail. Yeah, that's... Well, Garrett, I'm so excited to hear about your dad for one. And and I think with what you just said, that relates back to what we were talking about with the mission statement, because th- that's what this is about, is doing the actions as it relates to your mission statement so you enjoy what you're doing. The goal is just there as as a figure. And so even if the goal is really, really bothering you, just don't worry about it. Focus on what your mission is and focus on the actions that you're creating in your business plan and do those things. And then yeah. all of a sudden, the goal will be there. Yeah, I've even seen people sometimes throw the goal out the window and just focus on the systems and just say, you know, what, my goal is to my new goal now is just to do my Ninja Nine 100 percent every single week. And it's crazy is that they'll look back at the end of the year and they will actually typically go way beyond that goal, beyond what reality said, you know, was possible. But if that if that is really freaking you out, you almost need to separate yourself from it 100 percent, because when your goal is to hit 150 and all of a sudden you're crossing 175 your internal brain goes, whoa, like, what are we doing? Like we way past this goal and you'll actually stop doing your systems. It's the craziest Mm -hmm. thing. So if it really bothers you that much, make sure you separate yourself from that part of your business and just say, you know what? No, my date, my weekly goal is to do my Ninja nine, hundred percent. That's what we do. We're going to show up. We're going to do that at the end of the year, check in on the income. If it, if you really get stuck on it that much, which is a little scary for people because a lot of times if they had that much wrapped up in the income, there's a need for that income. So it's like, well, I can't not pay attention to it. Yeah, you can. The systems will produce your results. Just do the systems. What you focus on expands. Yep. There you go. All righty. Next question. I get to pick this one. one. You did the last one. Yeah. Yeah. I know. I was was reminding. I just, that was just me reminding. No, you're going to take it. You were going to (laughs) take it and that's not okay. Besides the Monday morning agenda and scorecard, how do the top agents best plan their week? Good question. And we actually got variations of this one too. A lot of questions like, why do the Monday morning agenda? Should I do it every week? Is it really useful? Is it only for people who are in coaching? And besides that, I, I don't know. I mean, doing the Ninja Nine, doing your daily routine, gratitudes, affirmations, but the Monday morning agenda, particularly having a planning session each week helps you understand exactly what's going on so that you can control your week. Yeah, there's lots of tools that are available. And, and for me, you know, when I came across the Monday morning agenda, I was like, well, that's, that's the simplest tool there is. I mean, how many people sit down and have a weekly business, business planning meeting with themselves to look at the week and say, how can I maximize these 168 hours that I have in front of me right now uh, for the next you know seven days? I feel that if you really go into that and you carry that Monday morning agenda on you, or you make sure that it's planned into your you know CRM, there's really nothing better. Now there are other tools out there like the Ninja Business, uh, so the uh, the Planner Book. That's a great great book that helps people typically make sure now they have a checklist to help them go through the week so they can check the boxes. I love checklists. Mm -hmm. Works really well for people. 
And I feel also sometimes that, you know, sometimes people do the Monday morning agenda, but then they don't actually get it down somewhere to be able to follow it. Like they, they create this idea of all these things they want to do on this vacation, but then they don't actually map out the days that they want to go and do those things on so they can get the most stuff done. They don't do the next step. And I think that that would be if you want to like take the Monday morning agenda to the next level. You know, don't just plan out the vacation. Look at the week that you have and say, well, we want to go on the ropes course and we want to go surfing and we want to go fishing one day. And like, well, how in the world are we going to get all this stuff in? Yeah, I, I think, too, when you look at those two tools, whether it's or well, I'll say three, the Monday morning agenda, the scorecard or using the Ninja Planner book, a lot too many people, I think, approach it as a reporting tool. You know, oh, oh I got to do this because I got to, you know, report to my coach or report to my broker about what I'm doing. And yes, it is helpful in reporting so you can look back and see where things are at. But it's it's an analyzation tool. It's there to help you analyze the prior week and set yourself up for success. So one of my favorite parts in the Monday morning agenda is, did you make your 50 Ford contacts this week? And we have a checkbox for yes or no and how many. And a lot of people will go, yes, 52 or no, 37 and move on. And I say, no, 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 stop there and then pull out where you've been recording those names and go back and look at those names and look at and ask yourself, do, do any of these people need to go on the warm list? Do they need to go on the hot list? Are there people I need to follow up this week? It's your time to focus on those people, not just simply report what you did. And that's the whole purpose of a planning session so that you can Focus on execution through the rest of the week because so much brain power is used through just thinking about stuff. And so that, that's how I look at those tools. And whether you're using those tools specifically or, or using something else to plan, the, the purpose is planning. Yeah. The MMA the, or the Monday morning agenda was never developed fully by me. I've tweaked it and I've made it mine over the years for Ninja Coaching. The original person is Nate Bowie. Nate Bowie used to work at the group. And I remember 15 years ago when I was sitting in his office, uh, sitting at the, uh, and not an installation back then. Installations didn't exist. It was retreats. And I was sitting at the retreat and he was sharing what he did to keep himself on track. And uh, Nate was like the quintessential squirrel or a dog that was going squirrel, squirrel, like just like all over the place. Like the, the guy just had crazy energy going in 10 different directions. And he said, if I don't have this, I can't keep myself on track. And I was like, Hmm, that's cool. I'll, I'll borrow that. And I talked to him. I said, you mind if I use this? He's like, no, not at all. Take it, run with it. That's why we use that in the coaching programs. I haven't found anything better that will allow you to analyze the business on the level that we want you analyzing it on. But I do think it's fascinating, Matt, and you kind of made a little bit of a lead into this, which is when sometimes people stop coaching or they take a break from coaching, the first thing they stop is their Monday morning agenda and this meeting with themselves. And that's always a sign to me is like, oh, you were never doing this for yourself. You were doing this for me or you were doing it for your coach. And more often than not, when they come back to coaching, they will say, you know, the first, the thing that actually like made things start to break apart. The first was like, I stopped doing the Monday morning meetings. I don't know why I stopped doing the Monday morning meetings. I'm always like, cause you were doing them for me. They're not for me. They're for you. My hope is that people that come out of coaching, they look at the Monday morning agenda and say, no matter what, whether Garrett's in my life or Matt Benelli's in my life or any other coach that we have is in my life. That is now part of my life, though, and I'm going to take this thing with me, and it's going to be forever. And that's how I hope people embrace it. That's where I've seen big successes with it. Not for us, though. Yeah, it's not part I, of coaching. Absolutely, and I want to. I want to also highlight that the people that I coach and and I know Gary, it's the same with you. The people who consistently do the Monday morning agenda comprehensively, meaning when you when I read it, I can tell that they're sitting there thinking about all of these things and analyzing and planning they're the ones that are following their business plan throughout the year. And they're also the ones that are hitting their goals sometimes even before they hit the fourth quarter. And so if, if you're looking for, you know, I think we, we had a prior question. What was the one thing you can single most important thing you could do every day? If there's a single most important thing you do every week, this would be it. In my opinion, doing your MMA every week and then focusing on people every day, you're going to be golden. Well, to emphasize it one more way, and Matt, I know you've seen this. I know all of our coaches have seen this. When somebody all of a sudden is like, man, it's really getting slow out there right now. Like things have really slowed down. Are you noticing that with other people around the United States? Before I go and analyze what other people are doing around the United States, I always go back and look at their Monday morning agendas. And I go back 45 days and almost 
always 45 days before this point where they're going, it's a little slow right now. They had some either major event happen in their life that's been causing a lot of stress and a lot of other things in their world. Or that was really the point where they stopped turning in their Monday morning agendas. They got off track. They got sidetracked with something else. And that Monday morning meeting stopped. And here we are 45 days later and they're going, it's really kind of oddly quiet. Like, do you, do you, is everything, have you seen this around with other agents out there right now? I'm like, 45 days ago, you stopped doing your Monday morning agenda. I know what the problem is. It's not anybody else. It's you. Like, come on, <laughs> like, let's get it going. So it, that it, it will mirror that 45 day rule. And it will also help you understand your business on that level where you can look back 45 days and say, why am I so successful right now? What was I doing? Oh, that's when I started really embracing the phone. Or that's when I started my mailing campaign. Hmm. Interesting. You get to know your business on a different level when you take the time to analyze it. That's what that's for. Yeah. Ah, perfect. 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 All righty. So I'm going. I'm moving on. I'm gonna. I'm gonna do two questions, Garrett, only because I want to point to a podcast episode. There's a question here. Um, Will you do two few, at once? Well, kind of. Kind okay, of. just go with it. Well, yeah, I know. You'll you'll see what I'm saying. You'll see what I mean when I get through this. <laughs> Roll with it, Garrett. Come on. I'm rolling. Uh, I'm rolling. We had a couple of questions about coaching. You know, why is it important? What is coaching? Uh, we did a podcast episode on this. It's. Uh, I think. We titled it the difference between coaching and training um, or something like that. So uh, I'll put that in the show notes. I'll find out which episode it is or what date that it was published on because uh, actually I have it right here. Episode 68, which was published on August 22nd. What is coaching? And so we go through in that episode why it's important, the difference between coaching and training. So go check out that episode for the answer to that question. Now, the question that I want to roll into Garrett is because I think this is a great one. How does a ninja approach career development? And I'll expand that to how does a real estate agent approach career development? Are you throwing that my way? Oh, I thought we were, I thought that's what we were doing. We were playing tennis. So <laughs> we're just going to, you did two questions. I'm going to go, what are you doing with this one now? <laughs> well, I, for, for me, when I look at career development and, you know, I'm looking at big picture of, you know, again, where are we going with this career? What are we trying to achieve? What is next year, year after that, year after that look like? And how does this thing grow? And can you grow it in a way that uh, is manageable as you move forward? This is a question I, I'm kind of stuck on because I want to see also where you want to go with it. But when I look at career development with this, I think a lot of people get very mindset of like, well, here's the stages. The stages are you're a rookie and then you go out on your own. And then you get maybe get some help and then you build a team. And then like there's this massive areas up here where you're like the runner of the show and you got all these minions running around below you. And what I have found with most of the people, if not all of the people that I've coached long term, is that uh, you you actually get to a place with Ninja that you're relationships become so incredibly strong and ingrained and powerful that the results actually, in an odd way, get exponentially better every single year. So it's not like you're having to work any harder or do anything more. You're just consistent with the things that you do, consistent with the people that you're you're you know applying those systems to, and and it just keeps growing and growing and growing, and the year keeps getting better and better and better. For instance, is and I and I know we've already talked about them on this podcast, but I just got off the phone with them yesterday, and we were reviewing his year, and this is Randall O'Dowd again. We were talking about the money that he made, and he's off a little bit on the money that he made this year. And it's like, it's okay. He's like, it's okay. And I said, well, you know, we started to dive deeper into it. He took two full months off. Like, he's off in his income, but he's taken two full months off, and he's traveled the world. And he's right now sitting for one month enjoying himself, still work, still got a way of like kind of doing business, but he's really with his wife enjoying a second home that they have and, and living life and enjoying himself and having a good time. So I think the career development and how that looks, I mean, you got to look at where you want to go and what you want this to be. But I think it's fun is that Ninja will take you naturally as long as you're consistent with it, that work keeps coming up. Uh, you don't need to go do new stuff or have new plans or new big ideas with this business of where you go to, it will naturally grow and develop every single year with the consistency. 
Yeah, I think it's a tough question to answer as like, hey, here's the answer, because it really depends on everybody. And this is where you have to look at your life list and your long term goals when you're doing your business planning, those goals that are extended for five, six, 10 years out, because some people want to move into managing, some people want to start their own company, some people want to move into coaching, training. Uh, some people want to write books. I mean, there's so many different things that you can do. I think that's the beauty of this business is you can go so many different directions. You can start a tech company like Austin Allison, who started Dot Loop. He was an agent, saw a need for better management of paperless documents and a system. And so he started Dot Loop and he grew that. Guarantee he's not listening to selling real estate anymore, which is okay. And I think so it, it all depends on where you want to go. You can start other things that are associated with it. You can grow a big team. There's so many things that you can do. I think you have to determine what do you want to be comfortable? What would make you comfortable? What type of lifestyle do you want to have? And then utilize the Ninja systems to help you go that way. Because I think that's the one thing that's awesome about Ninja is you can build an amazing business as a solo agent. You can build an amazing business with a big team. You can start your own brokerage. You can take Ninja outside of real estate and put it into an industry that is not even related to real estate. That's the beauty of Ninja. So I would say if, if there is a you know, a concise answer to say, how does a Ninja approach career development? A Ninja approach career development by going after what they want and doing it unapologetically yeah. and enjoying the things that they love to do. And I will say, to piggyback on that, is that it, it's an amazing platform that I have not, I haven't found a market that it doesn't work in yet, or a, an economic you know situation that it doesn't work in yet. So what I have found with a lot of people as they've done Ninja for a long time and they continue to grow is a lot of times they will have this amazing sphere of influence and database that just naturally produces them referrals and business. And it just happens. It just continues to happen. And sometimes they'll be like, I do, I want to go write that book. Or Lee Eckroth in Corvallis is a prime example. I've coached him for, we've been over 10 years now. A uh, amazing friend of mine, and he finally got to a point of going. I get real estate. I I like it. I do it. I'm I'm good at it. Um, but I I have this idea for this company that will help agents when they're going through the inspection period, and, and it'll help them be able to help their clients better. He goes, I'm going to put time and energy into that. And for the last two years, he's dumped major time and energy in that while keeping this real estate going on the backside, just kind of keeping it going. It's not the level he was doing it before, but it's humming along pretty good. But he's got a foundation now there that produces income very easily that will now allow him to go other things that he wants to pursue and his dreams that he has in his life. And I think that's how I think career development, Matt, as you put it, is, is that you know, it'll support you and this will support you anywhere you wanted to go. So, yeah, exactly. Exactly. All right. Your turn. What's our next question? Well, where are we at on here? Well, we've done a lot of them. There are some oh. that are probably going to definitely, that our podcast topics or podcast topics are coming. So I know we're not going to get to every single one, particularly since I think we're crossing the, or near the 90 minute mark on this, depending on how yeah, we've this like, Oh my God, when are they going to stop? <laughs> this is a long episode for <laughs> sure. So maybe we hit a couple more and, um, and we save the rest for the next, the next Q and a or, or for the podcast topics that we already have written down. Yeah. I'm going to pick one more here, Matt, then you can pick one more and I'm going to pick the difference between P I and E time. And I'm going to kind of do an, an abbreviated version of this. Cause I do find that this can turn into a, a really big, you know, kind of a, it can turn into a monster for some people really trying to break it all down. Uh, it's funny. P I and E time is very lightly talked about in the installation. I think they're actually starting to go into it a little bit more. Uh, because it is so powerful and how to analyze your business. But it, it's really effectively breaking your days down into three different time pieces. To make it real simple, P time is productive time. It's any time spent with a client in a selling situation. So if you are out showing property, you're at a listing appointment, you are currently writing a contract, you're, you're negotiating a contract, uh, the way you have to look at P-Time again is, is that without those activities, you will never, ever, ever receive a paycheck. You can sit around all day long doing other stuff, but unless you have this stuff happen, you will never get paid in the business. So that's what we call productive time. I-Time is indirect productive time, which is any time that, that allows you to create P-Time. So a lot of the Ninja systems, real estate reviews, lunches, notes, 
you know, your hour of power phone call, even customer service calls can fall into iTime because there's so many referrals that can come around the customer service calls if done correctly. Uh, that would be iTime activity. And a lot of people sit back and they go like, I'm not having any P time right now. And I'm like, well, because you're not doing any iTime. <laughs> like, what are you expecting it to fall out of the sky? Like, no, you do the iTime. The iTime will always produce the P time. It's impossible for it not Absolutely. to. So, so that's the iTime. And then E time, E time's a funny one, but this, this is something that really you don't have to track. And this is where I think people get really lost in P, P I and E time and tracking their hours is they try to figure out what their E time is. And really what it is, it's your total time worked minus P and I. <laughs> it's, it's all your time worked minus your P and I. And you are, you're, the number that pops out with that is your E time. Now, E time stands for everything else. And the actual way that I like to look at it is non-productive. Those two go hand in hand. Sometimes you'll hear people call it N time or E time. And I lean a little bit towards like, can we call it N? Because I like it that you look at it as non-productive. And when you look at it as non-productive, it makes you stop and go, ah, can I delegate it? Can I, you know, can I get it done very quickly? Can I make sure that I'm as, as efficient with it as possible? But it is time that people like to call e time because it does it, it's essential to the business. You have to do it. It has to get done in some way, and it's all that time spent from the moment you go under contract to the closing table. It's all that little stuff we have to do just to kind of maintain and run the business. Um, it's everything else besides I and P. And uh, it's important to know this stuff because I have found that some agents are wondering why they're not able to go to the next level. And we'll start tracking their hours and we'll find out that 80% of their time is is e-time or non-productive time. And it's like, well, that's your problem. If we can actually get the e-time under control, it will leave you more time for i-time or p-time or may leave you a whole bunch of open free time to go spend time with your loved ones. That, that's, that's where you stand there. And if you're wondering why you're getting bogged down, it's because you are overwhelmed with non-productive time in your business. So that's the difference of P, I, and E. It's a really, really awesome thing if you can track it. What I find for most people, uh, if they have the right tool in place and they get the right mindset, they can do it. Most people will do it for a couple of days. It's like tracking your calories. You know, it's like, okay, I'm going to track everything I eat this week and, you know, what the calorie count was on it. And you do it for about half a day and you're like, yeah, this is, yeah, no, I'm not doing this. <laughs> <laughs> at least that's what that's how i was when i did calories i'm like well oh, this is not fun i have to look at the side of every package and figure this out and do the math on it no that's not fun yeah it, that's i think where a lot of people end up with pi and e yeah it, it's it's an extra it's an extra task to do i will say though you mentioned tracking i think tracking can provide so many incredible insights and so I would encourage everybody to try to build a habit of tracking your your pie or, or pin time, as we like to call it. And I think one thing I'll add, because everything you said, Garrett, I obviously agree with, <laughs> um, is when you're looking at the analysis, look at your I time to P time ratio, because that is something that you can analyze and look at and say, how well am I doing with my I time? That's your phone calls, your face to face, handwritten notes, all that stuff to create P hours, because that is a ratio that when you really focus in your database, when you really operate the ninja systems and build a core sphere of influence that you're in flow with every month, you'll start to see that I time to P time ratio decrease, which is good. You know, when, when you get close to like one hour I leads to one hour P or half an hour of I leads to an hour of P, we're doing, we're doing, I mean, you're obviously very efficient. Not to say that two hours to one hour is, is bad. I mean, it all depends on how you are blending your life with your business, but that is a ratio that can really indicate how well you're doing with your communication and how well you're doing with your database and managing your warm list in particular. So that's why I think tracking it is important. And if you can get into the habit of doing it, you're going to see some really cool things that are going to help you just take a different perspective of your business. Yeah, and I'll, I'll throw in a real estate agent out here named Tara Tooley at the group. Coach Tara here for a couple years now, two years now. And uh, one of the interesting things that she focused on is like she's been trying, she tracks her hours, but it's like you can get stuck in the weeds real quick with it. And she had a moment one day in one of our, I think it was outside of our coaching call, but she brought it to the coaching call of saying, Garrett, you know what I figured out? I just need to focus on making sure I have eye time every day. Every day, I just need to make sure that I have some hours in my day that are eye time. And if I can focus on that and do that, I'm going to be successful and I'm going to hit my goal. 
And that was right around, she had a record breaking month. Like, and I'm, I don't want to share her numbers because they're, they're huge and scary and awesome because it can be a little too much for people. But like when you see somebody do a good yearly income in one month, put it in perspective, over six figures in one month. Uh, those are those moments you need to stop and be like, okay, something something's working. And that was when she really just stopped and said, I'm just going to focus on iTime. But that ratio you're talking about, Matt, of like, okay, so like one to one, one hour of iTime gives you one hour of P time. A lot of people ask me, what's a good ratio? And the challenge with that is, is that it depends on how you're tracking your information. Yes. And you really got to look at your number. And once you figure out your baseline, then you can ask yourself, well, how do I want to make my baseline better? And if it's a two to one, two hours of eye time making, giving me one hour of paid time or productive time, that's where your baseline is. And that's what you work off of. And you say, okay, well, how could I maybe make my eye time a little bit more effective? Maybe I can change up my, how I write my notes. Maybe I can do lunches a little bit differently. Maybe I can do real estate reviews a little bit differently, or maybe I can do my real estate reviews with different people and see if it also produces me more P time and reduces my ratio. But I have seen it as low as 0.45 to one. That's less than a half an hour of eye time, one, less than one half an hour producing a productive hour. And I've seen it as high as nine to one. Mm -hmm. uh, Larry, you told me years ago that at the group, he kind of likes to see it around two to one. Feels really good for me with coaching. I get antsy if we're not one to one. I'm like, we, we can do better. We can get down to one to one. But again, it is unique to the agent. Yeah. And I, I, I'm the same way. I like to see like, Hey, let's get to close to one to one as possible. And I think this is where it all depends how you look at your eye time and this holiday season, like you're going to your neighbor's holiday party. Are you going to count that as eye time? Probably not. Is it eye time? Probably is. And so, I mean, personally, I probably wouldn't track it down on my tracker as, yeah, I'm, I'm getting some eye time in. That's where I'd probably focus more on my hour of powers and everything so I can really make sure I'm doing the activities of the Ninja 9. But if you live a social lifestyle, and I'm not saying that you have to, but if you do, there is this weird thing where you're like, I'm not putting that many hours in. Like, where is this coming from? And that's like, well, your lifestyle is putting you in front of a lot of people. So you're in flow with a lot of people there that, you know, you're not putting into your tracking sheet. So, so there's that. Too. Well, Matt, what, what you've said before in the, pa in the past, which I loved, is, you know, harmonizing your, your life and your business together. And I think the more you harmonize your life and your business together and people say, you know, when you really figure that out, you're not working anymore. Mm -hmm. And yeah, the holiday parties are actually building your business. And you could look at it as like, the it's the more the mindset changes is I'm going to this holiday party to build my business or I'm going to this holiday party. And isn't it cool that I have a business that I get to do things that are fun with my friends. And I, I this is what builds my business. Like, isn't this cool? So if you're tracking your numbers, I would look at it as like, yeah, I went to a holiday party. I'm with all my friends. I was there for three hours. Let's give an hour of it to I time in my business. Yeah. Because it really is effective in my business. Uh, but it, the minute you start to look at it as a business model and like, I'm doing this to get more business, that's when it changes the dynamic a little bit. And again, it, it's not necessarily the easiest thing to track. I will also add, if you have a good system and calendar and schedule that you follow, if you're really good at time blocking, this is also easier to track too. If you fly by the seat of your pants with your schedule, good luck tracking your hours. Yeah. This is where you got to put your stuff on the calendar. You got to have your hour of power on there and everything. Because you could go back and say, hey, look, here's what I did. Uh, I'll actually throw out a tool too uh, as, as well here. Toggle, T-O-G-G-L. It's a free time tracking tool. There's a web-based version and an app. It can sync with your calendar so that if you have all of your stuff actually on your calendar, you can literally go into the app and just click on your calendar appointments and it'll transfer over and you can classify it. You can have a P, I, and E category right in there and you can just hit, time. And then at the end of the week and the end of the month, it, it'll show you your ratios and everything. And it's it's super simple. T-O-G-G-L toggle. Uh, really cool little time tracking tool. So throw that out there. That's awesome. All right. Well, I kind of threw that one on the table, Matt, and then I answered it. So you have, you have your fun here with one last one. Yeah. So I think we'll, we'll do this one last one and then we'll go into our quote final question that I think we've determined will be the final question. But the one that I'm, I want to throw out there 
is the best practices. And I know we'll probably do a full podcast on this, but I think there is maybe a short ish way to answer this, but best practices around arranging real estate reviews. And particularly when you're a new agent, because, Hey, I don't, I don't have customers that I've sold homes to, to do real estate reviews with. And I get that. And then this person who asked a question put in parentheses, or is that a limiting belief? And I think you're answering your own question here. <laughs> because yeah, I, if you're if you're saying, oh, I don't have anybody to do real estate reviews with, it's going to be hard to find people to do real estate reviews with. I think there's a couple of keys that I do tell people when you're preparing real estate reviews. And the first is make sure people know it's coming. You don't need to surprise people with these. You know, you don't want to be out to lunch with somebody who's never really talked to you about real estate and be like, hey, so guess what I did for you? <laughs> They're going to be like, what, what are you doing? Uh, I thought we were just having lunch as friends and now you're you're pitching me business. <laughs> Can you imagine if your tax advisor did that? Like you go out to lunch with them and then they sit you down with all of these ways that you can save money in taxes this year and how they can help you or whatever that might be. It's like, oh, God, yeah. here we go. I mean, when you're not expecting it, it's it's not. It's not fun for the other person. So let people know that it's coming. I think if you if you have prior clients, definitely start doing it with them. Call them up. Hey, guys, it's time for your annual real estate review. I put together some information. And this is the other thing. Prepare the packet before you call and make the appointment. Because if you tell people, hey, I prepared this for you, they're more likely to say, yeah, let's do it. If you say, hey, would you like me to prepare? Garrett, most people are like, Eh, I, I don't want to put you out. I, you know, I'm not really thinking of doing anything. So you don't need to go through that effort, right? I mean, that's that's kind of how people respond to that. Oh, you ask the question that'll that'll kill it right there. Like, would you like me to prepare this for you? For me, uh, no, I'm okay, dude. Like, thanks. Um, yeah. I got lots of stuff. We're busy right now. We got all stuff things going on. Uh, I just it's just not kind of in. We're we're not even looking at selling right now. Like, so we're okay. Yeah. But if I say Garrett. I've prepared this packet of information for you. It's time for your annual real estate review. It's got a lot of great stuff that I know you're going to like. Love to catch up and grab a beer. What are you doing on Thursday? Yeah, man. Again, for me, it's like part of me is also like you can, when you put it out like that, I know that he's already created it. I know the packet's there. He's already put his time and energy into it. And plus, I'd like to grab a beer with Matt anyway. It's like, well, yeah, like I could probably, we could probably make a beer work here one of these nights. Yeah. So. Um, so prepared in advance. I mean, that's that's the one of the big things that a lot of people miss that makes this a lot easier right there. I will say, uh, you know, you talk about the limiting belief about how can we do these things. And I think a lot of us get really locked up into what is a real estate review and at what level does it have to be done to. And the real big picture is, is being able to sit with somebody and have an educated conversation about real estate and seeing if you can make it so that there's value in it for them. When I was brand new agent, uh, I didn't have anybody. It had a very small database. But what I would do is I would print off the actual FHFA uh, house price index. It's an 80-page document. It's actually, we use pieces out of it to build the real estate review. But I would put a big old staple on the top of it. I would carry that thing on me every quarter. I had a couple copies of it. And what I found is I would have a conversation with somebody and they'd be like, hey, what's going on in real estate right now? And I'd start talking. They'd be like, oh my gosh, I have the coolest thing. Can I show you something real quick? And they'd be like, sure. <laughs> I was like, all right, hold on a second. I'd like run out to the car and grab it. And we would sit down in the front room over a beer, sitting down over lunch. and be like, dude, check this out. And it had nothing to do with them. It wasn't even there. There was nothing in there on their house at all. But I would go through and be like, here, check this out. Look what's happened. Look, look at the states. Look at look at the different appreciation rates by states, and here look at the bottom ones. Can you believe the difference between you know Washington and the state of Washington and you know, this state down here? Look at the difference, and you're flipping through it, and then you could say like, here, check out, check out, check out Reading, and we go down to Reading, and we kind of look at those numbers, you know, and here's here's where we rank out of all the metropolitan cities in the United States, and it usually these people would go like. Where do you get this thing? Like, like where where is this from? I'm like, oh, I, this is research I do every single quarter that helps me know what's happening in the real estate markets and what's going on. Like, do you want this thing? Like, I I I I can get another one. Sometimes they take it, sometimes they wouldn't. But then I would also add is that you know, the real reason I do this is I do a what's called a real estate review where I actually sit down with people and look at their residence, like their real estate and go a little bit more in depth. I'll use these, this piece of information and comps, you know, recent sales, things like that, just to show people where they stand in the marketplace. And it's something that I do annually for people that want it. 
sometimes that would lead right into them going like, can I be on that list? Or I might be like, do you want me to put you on the list? And they may be like, well, yeah, that would be interesting to know. And so this would be like, no, 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 we're good. But it was interesting is that was my lead in to start building a list of people that annually I could do real estate reviews with because I didn't have anybody. I took that approach and it worked. Is it for everybody? I don't know. Worked for me. I, that approach sounds pretty awesome. Quite honestly, <laughs> I think that approach could be for everybody. I think it's if you guys have the information ready to go in a basic form and can, because people are going to ask you, hey, Garrett, how's the market? People ask that question. Sometimes people are just being polite because they think it's the right question to ask somebody who's in real estate. And some people are actually interested, and those are great questions to follow up on. So even if you don't have the information with you and you're out there today and somebody says, hey, how's the market? And you have a, a short conversation, which by the way, you should always respond with, well, what part of the market? Are you interested what in part of the market are you talking about? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Don't just launch into a, oh, well, here's what's happening. Um, but follow up on that conversation. Say, you know, Garrett, you asked some great questions about the market the other day, and I know we didn't have the opportunity to go in detail. So I put together some information that I think you're really going to like. You know, I'd love to get together for that coffee. I'll bring this along and you can take a look at it if you like. Perfect. Yeah. My, my approach as a, as a new agent, when I was first trying that out, it made a huge difference in how excited I was about the information. So if anybody wants to try that, uh, you just need to know that the more excited, like, again, you've got to be in their world with them. And we're talking like, this is not just like, oh, they mentioned real estate. I'm going to go run and grab this packet of information. It's more like in talking with them, all of a sudden I'd be like, oh my gosh, do can I go grab it? I want to share something with you that's when I would have the packet and we could go through it and flip through just the pages that we need. I mean, it's like literally sitting down with a book and saying, I think it's on page 50 here. Hold on, let me show you this. And like, you're just going to specific little pieces of it that you think that they're going to find interesting or like, look at the, that you're excited about. The more excitement I brought, the more they were like, what is going on here? And, but it also let them see that this was a passion of mine. They very qu quickly were like, you do this every month. Like you look at this thing every quarter, you analyze the markets down to this level. I'm like, yeah, it's my job what I do. I love it. Here, look at this. And that excitement with it made them understand that this wasn't just work for me. It wasn't just like, it was like, I have a real passion behind this. And that I felt helped me with my real estate tremendously. Oh, absolutely. As a and I counted them as real estate reviews, by the way. If I sat down and had that moment with somebody sitting on their back porch in that just kind of in the moment thing, I had no problem counting that as my real estate review. I would check that off with a big smile on my face. Absolutely. I totally would. And I think what's cool about that too is people look at the term client and what does that mean? And typically we define it as somebody we've done a transaction with. But that conversation, Garrett, that you had with that person on the back porch, that person is now a client. They're under your advisorship. That person is getting real estate advice from you. That is one of your clients. You don't have to transact business with people for them to be quote unquote a client. And this is where the real estate review eliminates that whole term past client. Because what is, a past client? No way. We have clients. We have some that are actively transacting and we have some that are actively holding real estate. And that's that's the way that I would look at it. I agree. Cool. Awesome. Dude, this has been this has been great. We have we have a final question here, which I think is a fun one. But uh but this we got a lot of great questions from everybody. I think this is once we mash all this together, I think we're gonna be looking at what, an hour 45 or so of doing this? This is great. Oh my gosh, yes. I hope everybody's out there going like, when are they going to stop? <laughs> <laughs> well, and if you've listened this far, you hopefully have gotten all the questions or maybe you scrolled all the way to the end to hear what we talk about at the end. But the, in the show notes, there's a breakdown of what the questions are, what timestamp they're at, so that you can go back and reference a particular question if you want to go and hear that answer again or share it with somebody because maybe somebody has asked you one of these questions and you're like, oh, here the answer's right here on episode 100 of Ninja Coaching Coast to Coast at you know 20 minute, 24, 35 seconds. Um, so use this as a resource too. I do want to add in before we do this last question, because I think we need to wrap it right with this last question, is that um, I really have loved doing this. Um, and yeah, I know here we are at the 100th episode doing a question and answer like this. And uh, I foresee us doing this more often. So as you are listening to this and we're wrapping this up, if you feel that this is something you got a lot of value out of and you'd like to have this be something that we do more often, uh, I could see doing this more often. This is very, very, very fun for me. I enjoy kind of the uh, not getting stuck on one topic and kind of getting to jump around to these different pieces. So um, yeah, just let us know because I, I, I could see doing more of these if you guys took uh, enough value out of it. Yeah, absolutely. And 
It's so much fun. I think when we threw out, hey, we're doing this Q&A, we got some questions. And then I actually got a few messages too of like, and, and here's a good topic for a podcast as well. And so I love that you guys are out there thinking about this stuff because that does help us. I will say Garrett and I have a list that is miles long of, of topics that we're excited to dig into as we finish up this year and go into the new year that we're not slowing this thing down. Tuesdays and Thursdays is when we publish these episodes and they, that will continue for sure. And and I'm having a lot of fun with it too, Garrett. It's one of the highlights of my week absolutely is getting here and, and chatting with you and doing the podcast and then getting to interact with people as they are, as they're commenting and doing the things that they do with the podcast. I was at an event the other night and people were talking about the podcast and how it's helping them, you know, stay focused on things. And I was like, that's awesome. That's really, really exciting because that's the whole reason why we do this is to bring value to you and to hear that that value is being received makes, fills my heart up. It's really nice. Yep. That's what it's all about, which ends us then with the last question, which is, uh, Matt, can I take this one or do you want to take it? Go for it, man. All right. I love it because it's, (laughs) it's all encompassing. Is the world a friendly place? I'll, we're going to go back the old route of this. I said the question. Let's let's. I'm going to lob this into your court. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> this question came from one of our coaches, and I love that she put it out here because in, she is probably if you uh, anybody out there who knows Gretchen Adams, Gretchen Adams is is a the world is a friendly place is probably a T-shirt that she has. Because she is the, uh, I'd say the poster child for the world is a friendly place. My answer is going to go right along with you, Matt. Yes, the world is a friendly place. I think the world is what you're looking for out of it. And I think if you decide to look for friendship, if you decide to look for love, if you decide to look for connections with people and what this, you know, the big picture is all about here, uh, it's all over the place. You can find it in every nook and cranny that you decide to look in. Uh, I will also put out that if you decide not to, if you decide to go the other route, you can find that also. So um, I think the the answer to this is definitely yes. The world is definitely a friendly place. Uh, I get it to see it every day by all the people that I have surrounded myself with. And I've had a very uh, um, interesting experience we're going through in our life that I'll share uh, save the details on for you. But uh, in going through this, I have very clearly seen that the world is not only a friendly place, it is over an abundance and amount of love that I have seen out of people who have stepped out to help me, to help my family. And uh, and then we see it from you guys through this podcast every single week, the amount of uh, friendliness, but I'm going to go farther with love that people have out there. So uh, the world is what you're looking for, and it is full of friendship and love and good people. And that's what I'll end this with. It absolutely is. And, and Garrett, I'll add to that. Whereas if, if you're looking for all that, take something that I learned from Garrett when Garrett, when you were coaching me and you told me this or very early on was an affirmation that you use is great things happen to me every day. Use that as an affirmation and you will find great things every single day. No doubt. Matt, thank you for sharing that. And uh, again, I appreciate all of you out there. I know this was a long episode and uh, we have had lots of people over the last couple of last year here that have said, uh, hey, can you make them a little bit shorter? And here we go with a monster. But um, (laughs) It is a monster, but at least there's a guy. (laughs) At least you can go through and say, I'll go over here and listen to that question. (laughs) There's there's chapters. There's there's chapters you can go to. So um, again, I appreciate all of you guys. Thank you so much. This has been super fun. I can't believe we're wrapping up episode 100. I don't know. Do we celebrate 200? Or do we just go to right to a thousand? Is that our next celebration? Because I, I don't want to wait that long. <laughs> I, maybe we just celebrate 110. <laughs> so we just well, keep, keep the celebrations going. Uh, maybe we'll do the next going. one at a certain number of total downloads. Maybe when we hit 100,000 downloads, that'll be the next one. 100,000 total downloads. I'll add up Spotify and the other stuff that's tracked. And that can be the next the next big one. How about that? I'm excited for that. Let's do that. 100,000 downloads. Again, thank you, Matt. I can't believe we've been doing this for 100 episodes already. I can't believe here we are wrapping up 2019. But thank you, man. I couldn't do this without you. I couldn't have made this come together. And there's... Uh, as people have told me, there's just a certain kind of chemistry that we have that kind of resonates with each other. And I 100% agree. Couldn't imagine doing this with anybody else. Same here, Garrett. And I direct all that same sentiments back towards you. 
Absolutely. It's been wonderful. I couldn't imagine doing this with anybody else for sure. And, and I appreciate everybody who's tuning in. We love you guys. Have an amazing, amazing day. If you are heading into your holiday vacations and everything, enjoy all of that time with friends and family. And welcome to the end of the year. And we'll talk to you guys soon. Thanks, everyone. Thank you for joining us here on the Ninja Coaching Coast to Coast podcast. We appreciate your time and attention. If you received some value out of this episode, we would love for you to share it, subscribe to the podcast, and if you feel so compelled, to leave us a review. Have an amazing day. We'll see you soon.